I'm going to talk about a virtual reality assessed by games. Let's put that in context. So virtual reality, it's introduced in part one of our degree briefly in a module called Application to Computer Science, but mainly it's taught in a third year module uh, called virtual reality, which is partly about VR, but it's also partly above uh, graphics because that's got maths in it, which makes it easier to set exam questions. Um, but a lot of the coursework, which is worth 70% of the module, is about producing virtual worlds, but using the Unity game engine, which is why I can be talking about this subject in this particular uh, session. So key point is that the specifications for the coursework are quite simple, open-ended, which allows our students to be creative. And why are they creative sometimes? So in terms of virtual reality, what a good virtual world is one which is interesting, plenty to do, plenty to explore, suitable interaction with the world, and it's easy to navigate. Doesn't necessarily need to be photorealistic and help, doesn't need to be. Uh, but it's better, I feel, if there is some sort of consistent theme in the virtual world and the students get better marks for that. Um, it avoids jarring distractions when you sort of forget that you're in a virtual world or we, and so forth. So the aim of the virtual worlds I want them to produce is that they should be immersive and you've got some presence within the virtual world. So there are two courseworks. There's an individual one that they do to start with. It's to produce a relatively simple virtual world. It's got to have a building of some sort within a certain environment. Somehow the students need to include their student number that's a sort of an anti-plagiarism thing, so we know it's them who's done it. And because we mark things anonymously, it's the student number, not their name. Uh, and the user must be able to explore and interact with the world. And it's up to the students to decide how to interpret that specification. Uh, and then there is a group project, typically four or five students working together. And the idea of it in a group is that if you're producing a more complicated virtual world, then you need to have different skills. Someone might be very good at scripting or building models in this package or that package, etc. Uh, and each year, I change the theme for the group world. I don't change the first one. And every year I've been doing this, which is now about five or six years, the students impress me with a different interpretation of the world. So what I'm going to talk, show is a series of examples of worlds which students have produced over the years. Um, generally, I have run the virtual world and I'm not very good at doing computer games and so forth. So sometimes the movements are a bit jerky. That's me rather than their world being wrong. So over the, world, over the years, there have been many imaginative worlds. A certain amount of humour creeps in. There is great creativity. Yes, it's supposed to have a building. We're going to see one with eight buildings. It makes a lot of sense to have eight buildings. And because there's so much variety, it's a pleasure, well, almost a pleasure, to mark them. Uh, here's uh, an idea. I, I talk about saying having a consistent theme. Well, this one's deliberately anachronistic because you've got an old fashioned castle, but inside it is a very modern building. Old castle, modern building. And you go into it and then you see things. I'll do something with that ball there, I've walked past it. But you can see different things in there. You can still see the castle walls through the window. Move on to next example. Some of them turn the world into a game. So in this next one we're going to show, you, you have to go into the house, pick up the student number, 
then take the student number to the teleport where you'll be sent to a room where you'll see a photo of the student. Now, as I said before, we, the student has to have their number in there, not their name, because I'm supposed to mark it anonymously. So you might think, well, why, how are we going to see a photo of the student and not break that? So here we are going into the building, inside the world, inside the building. Quite nice feature, you can still see a map of where you are. Uh, oh, look, there's the student number. Can we pick it up? A bit fiddly when you're bad at moving around in a virtual world like I am. But I did manage to pick it up. Uh, and then, oh, I've got to find the teleport zone. So, outside, teleport zone. Oh, there's the teleport. Yes, bing! Oh, yes. There's the photo of the student. <laughs> But no, I don't recognise it. <laughs> Bit of humour. Uh, this one, uh, a museum. Now, as I say the line, as in Reading, in, the, in Reading, in the Abbey Park, you can see the, the statue of the line, which we just briefly see. And you go inside a museum. Something to do is a bit different. Well, there's something behind the bookcase. Yeah, open. Oh, look, there's a dragon. Just something a bit different. Then you can go back outside and carry on exploring. Move on. And then this is the one with eight buildings. Got beach huts. I see. You see that? So you're out on a key. So I go out. I thought, well, let's go and explore. What's at the end of the key? Oh, there's a boat. Can I do something with it? Oh, yeah. I can set it to go for sailing off. So I do that and watch that. And then I'll come back and say, well, let's, well, let's, well, the buildings, right. And you can see there are eight beach huts. Now a student number has got eight digits. And each beach hut has on it one number. One of the numbers. And if you go inside, it, you see it's nicely fully furbished. If you go into any of them, they're all fully furbished. Clever interpretation of the specification. Some students go a bit, do a lot. So this year I had two very good bits which were very complicated and so forth. So Ali produced a wonderful world. It had so much detail that I felt I couldn't do justice to exploring it. So I asked him to do a video of his world. Jamie produced another world with, with a sort of game element in it because you first had to find a pin code for the safe. You then had to go and find the safe. Inside the safe was a key. Having got the key, you then had to go and find the boat to go to the building where, when you go inside, which you have to unlock using the key that you've already picked up, you can find the student number. It was actually such a big, complicated world. It, 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 was, it ran so very slowly on my uh, work desktop. I'm due a new desktop, which is quite nice. Um, but I asked him to produce a video. So here's Ali's Pirate Island. Hello, everyone. My name is Ali Mandini. And I'll be giving you a small tour of my virtual reality course. Work. I decided to create a pirate island that you're stranded on. And as you can see in the distance, there's a huge cabin for you to wander into. When we walk up to the cabin and you're at the door, you'll be prompted to press a button to open the door. And once you're inside, you are greeted with all these different interactable objects, such as in this room, you can pick up the boat or the sword, or you can go up to this room here, and you can pick up these swords on the walls, or the items on the table. One feature I've added is if you walk up to this oar and you pick it up, you can run towards the starting area, and if you were to run behind into the deep dark forest, you can see there's a little graveyard. If you were to walk into it and press the button, you dig up 
let's go. Now that we're here, we can head over to the left towards the top. As you can see, there's a skeleton sitting on the log, and if you were to walk up to him, a message would pop up, giving a sort of a role-playing factor that the player is thinking to themselves. We can pick up the fishing rod, and look at the fish swim in the pond. If we were to go back to the middle, and go towards the cabin, you can see some numbers of the tag. And this is my student number, but what you can do is you can walk into it and a message will pop up. Kind of giving it a survival feeling that someone used to be here. Another place where the messages pop up is on this boat here. And last but not least, my final but favourite addition to this is if you were to walk onto this bank and you were to press the button, you can drive the boat. Thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed this mini tour of my pilot island. You've got quite a good marks for that. <laughs> This is James. Upon starting the launch, you can see we are presented with a hint menu telling us of the controls. Uh, so WASD to move respectively uh, left, right, forward, backwards. Uh, Spacebar we can use to jump on the terrain, as you can see with the gravity obviously making us fall. And then we also have a hint so saying inside the house you may find a living room, the whole of this room, lay a book, seeking for information. So you can close this pop up by pressing Q and then that won't be reopened again. So this is the initial house, again with reflecting windows, so I can go up to the door, presented with the menu to open it by pressing E, so pressing that, play the audio clue, Q and animation, I can close this, so I'll close behind me. So initially this room, again another door, this room is purely for decoration, nothing important in here. We go to the living room, which you told us to go to, there's a, uh, a fire, a fireplace. Uh, windows we can see out of, um, with light reflecting on them, as well as the glass table. And on this table is a pin. As you can see, a hint number, a hint pops up, telling us that this is a secret code, and it's potentially for the safe upstairs. So we'll remember that pin, 5623. We then navigate up the stairs. It's the bedroom. Again, more windows, a computer set up for bed. From here, that we can see the safe. So it says enter the four digit pin. Uh, so once we get the vicinity, this will disappear. And again, we'll be hinted to actually tell us to, uh, what to do. So from here, we can use our number keys uh, to input the number. So it was five, six, two, three. Now, I couldn't press backspace to actually delete this input. And as you can see, no matter what I input, I can remove this by pressing backspace, or if I enter the number and hit enter, it's correct, it'll say success, just to make sure it's still there. I can now pick up the key with E, and now another hint is provided. The key, this may come in handy, navigate the old wooden bar and you shall find a dock. You shall find a pub by close sitting down below a boat, take sail to wherever the wind may take you. So again, I'm going to follow this wooden path. I'm going to close the pop up now with Q, That's where we came from. The trees are scattered throughout the world. And this is a dock we were asked to find. So from here, now we're next to the boat. I can sit on the boat with E. Uh, I can also get off the boat now that I'm on it. I can just jump and walk about. I can get off the boat if I wish. But I'm going to sit on the boat again. And this time I'm going to press R to drive. Now I'm being escorted by the boat to the destination. I cannot move, I cannot jump, but I can look around. I also cannot exit the animation. Now 
Now that I've arrived, um, again I'm locked on the boat, so I have to press F to escape the boat. So now I can leave the boat. And from here, I'm for, uh, prompted with a hint on the door. It says the door is locked, so I have to press, I cannot press E to open the door. I have to initially press F to use my key that I clicked previously to open the door. And now I can open the door with E, and I can subsequently close it. And then inside here is the student number. A variety of interpretations of a world with a building and a student number that you can interact with. We have a question. That one had audio where the other ones we see didn't have it. Is that right? Really it's up to the students whether they put audio on or not. Yeah. Um, the, the, these were playing, uh, they, they, those last two, the students did a video of their world rather than me running their world. I'll let them describe it for me because why should I talk when they can? So then there's the group project, and, and every year I change the theme. So here we've got some examples of the themes that we've had. Uh, have an educational theme. Impossible worlds. Well, if you're creating a virtual world, why make it realistic? Um, a health-related. I had a very successful KTP project, which was more in the area of um, medical side of things. So that inspired me to say, well, put a health theme into it. Climate change, that seemed a good topic. Uh, fake news, again, it's in with the idea of virtual worlds that aren't quite realistic in some respects. So, impossible world, I've said some of those. Um, best one here is, well, if you look at it, think Salvador Dali, Morris <coughs> Escher, or even Lewis Carroll. <laughs> Just like the music. Escher Cube, impossible. Go through a portal. Different version of the same world. Oh. What happens if we fall down there? Lewis Carroll and then we'll drop out of the bottom and guess where we'll end up <laughs> here we come and we're back where we were just love that. And the health one. Um, virtual reality has often been used for health related issues. For instance, it can be a distraction for pain and so forth. Uh, demonstrations of treatment. There's quite a, a recent thing I, uh, last year that, that was able to explain a medical procedure to a couple of parents on something they were going to do to their, their child's head. So they're going to put something in there. So the VR could demonstrate actually what would happen to it. Treating of phobias, good use of virtual reality. Um, so I was, as I said, I was supervisor of a KTP project which was about moving training for medical practitioners, GPs, uh, practice nurses, et cetera, from traditional face-to-face -to, -face to online, um, and 18 months into the project, COVID's hit. <laughs> but we were ready. Perfect timing for a project. Um, so, yes. What does KTP stand for? Knowledge Transfer Project. It's a, it's a government-funded scheme for bringing academia and industry together. Um, so yes, but it inspired the theme. So let's have a couple of one's a hospital and one talks about phobias. So here we are in a hospital. So they've got the sound in it, which is nice. Um, then there are different rooms, including a maternity room where actually they did show give it growing birth, but I'm not going to show that one. Um, but if it's a virtual world and you want to show something like multiple sclerosis, you can show it in a 
a different sort of way. This is an example of when they, they've got a virtual world as a group, then different people do different rooms, as opposed to uh, different people having different skills like animation or writing scripts or building uh, models and so forth. So that was about information about multiple sclerosis. It may well have been a, a reason why one of them wanted it. Uh, and then there was a blood testing thing where you actually had to do something with a syringe, etc. But then something to show CPR. So you go outside. So it's something about helping someone who's perhaps who needs CPR for some reason or other. Hands-only CPR. The first step is to send someone to call your local emergency response number or call it yourself. Then get directly over the victim. Put the heel of one hand in the center of the chest. Then put your other hand on top of the first. Then push hard and fast in the center of the chest until help arrives. It's important to push, giving 100 to 120 compressions per minute, which is about the same tempo as this song. Quite a comprehensive bit on there. But the same theme, same year, phobias. Different phobias you can treat. Arachnophobia is an obvious one. You like spiders? Well, let's go in. Blue uh, tells you some instructions. And you've got a couple of buttons, more or less spiders. At the moment, you only have more. If you click it once, you get a spider. And you can click on it again. This is me running it, which is why it's not as smooth as other people. And then you've got a few more spiders, a more one that moves around. Some more, might we? We've got three. We get more than three. Here we are. Oh, yeah. And the idea in it for treating phobias is you build up gradually so you get used to it. I hadn't heard of nyctophobia. It's not smoking, is it? No. <laughs> Darkness. Scared of the dark. So in this room, you can stare at different toys to get the light on or light off. And then at the monkey on the left you come back to the main room and then another one there was one on claustrophobia this one's on sort of a acrophobia sort of fear of heights and so forth so again you get used to it by going up at the height to a little bit again they've got instructions there then you go along and then you have to jump and bounce back up Forgot to show the instructions. Up we go, wee. Would you want to walk the plank? <coughs> then fake news. Well, again, lots of ideas, variety of them. Fake moon landings was one. Two or three came up with that particular theme. It was the era of Trump, of course, so there were lots about that. And then something about climate change for the skeptics. Um, so let's show uh, two. One is the fake moon landings, and one is the Museum of Illusions, which was quite fun. So this is demonstrating the conspiracy theory that we didn't go to the moon. And so here you've got the set. And you can 
go around and visit behind the scenes. See, there's some cheese. See it at different points. I don't think there's much more, so I'll move on to uh, the next one. Fake news, fake museum of illusions. Right, clever. There are eight. I managed to find seven. As you move across, get into the right place, you can see the word illusion. Go inside. Classic example of an illusion, Ames room. Crouch down to have a look. And you can go and actually sort of see what it's like, the actual wing. Uh, an optical illusion sample here. See, it's not a perfect pyramid. This one's quite fun. I just didn't navigate it very well. One of the Mona Lisa's fake, fake, click to find out which one. Yeah, now it's the wrong way up. You see what he actually looks like. So, so I found seven out of eight. I'm not quite sure what the eighth one was. Um, so comments. Noth's famous book, The Art of Computer Programming. It demonstrates that computer science is a creative subject. You are creating programs, creative solutions, and so forth. Clearly, virtual reality and games are related. Uh, it's thus fitting to my mind that the virtual reality coursework is there to allow creative interpretations of the simple specifications I give them. And that allows them to include a game element into their, into their virtual worlds where appropriate humor, and they are quite humorous on occasions. And hopefully the examples that I've shown uh, show some of these. And they did most of the work. Not me, I just facilitated it. So thanks to the various people. I had to go back a few years to try and remember who did what. But those are the people who did either the individual or the group. 